Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm Emma Harris, a barrister at Goldsmith Chambers, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Jacqueline McKenzie of McKenzie Butte and Pope. She's obviously not only a lawyer, but also the director of the Centre for Migration Advice and Research, and of course, very well known and appreciated for her work and representation of over 200 Windrush claimants. So thank you for joining us, Jackie. Um, just before we start, I have to let you know, I think it's already been put in the chat, but um, we are recording. So if there are any problems with that, please do let us know. Um, as we go along, um, if you have any questions um, for now, please just put them in the chat and we will hope to get to them um, in the session at the end where we have our discussion. Um, so. The aim of this session is to get you really thinking about the issues that arise in Windrush cases. You have um, two case studies that should have been sent to you in advance, but if you didn't receive them or don't have them to hand, don't worry. Um, we're going to be popping them in the chat so that you can download them from there um, because you're going to need them for your discussions. Um, also in the chat, we're going to put a copy of the handout so that you um, essentially have a copy of the slides with you. And also I'm going to provide um, an extract from the Home Office's Windrush casework guidance, which you might find useful when we come to look at who can apply under the Windrush scheme. I'm going to be starting with a whistle stop tour of relevant immigration and nationality law in this area. And then Jackie is going to take you through the Windrush scheme, who's eligible to apply and what they're eligible to apply for. We're then going to split into smaller groups to discuss the case studies. Half of you I'm going to ask to look at case study one, half to look at case study two. And if you find that you have the time, then you're obviously welcome to have a look at both. We're all going to then come back together as a group and go through them both together, hopefully answering any questions that have arisen. So, um, like I say, any questions in the chat as we go along, but there will be a chance to discuss things a bit more openly later on. Um, so, starting off then, um, prior to to the British Nationality Act 1948. Um, if you or your father were born in a British colony, then you were born a British subject. The British Nationality Act 1948 was introduced as many countries started to get their independence from the British Empire. Those who continued to belong to the UK or its remaining colonies and who had previously been a British subject automatically became a citizen of the UK and colonies or a CUC as you'll see it written. Simultaneously, people suitably connected to the countries that were gaining independence became citizens of those countries instead. Together, citizens of the UK and colonies and citizens of those newly independent Commonwealth countries were all collectively referred to as Commonwealth citizens. That was an umbrella term for everybody. From 1948 until 1962, there were no restrictions on the ability of citizens of the UK and colonies or on any other Commonwealth citizen to be able to come to the UK to live and work. People who arrived during this time are described as having freely landed. This changed with the Commonwealth Immigrants Act 1962. Commonwealth citizens, including Cucks, who were not born or registered in the UK, were now subject to immigration controls and might have restrictions, for instance, put on the length of their stay here. That didn't happen in all cases, but it became a power that the immigration officials had when our people arrived. Importantly, immigration controls could not be imposed on any Commonwealth citizen who'd already been living in the UK for two years or on the wife or child of any Commonwealth citizen. Now, a lot of the Windrush generation are people who came here as children with their parents, and there was no power at all prior to 1973 to put a time limit on the length of residence of those children. The next major legislative change to affect many of these people will have been the independence legislation that was brought in for their country of origin or the country of origin of their parents. You'll need to know when a person's country of origin gained independence and how those countries identified their citizens. For this purpose, I highly recommend Fransman's British Nationality Law as a very good place to start because it contains country by country information for all former UK colonies. It's pretty essential for nationality law specialists. The most common formula for nationality used on independence was the standard two point formula. 
Within its independence legislation, the newly independent country would claim as its citizens any person who was born in that country after independence, as well as any citizen of the UK and colony who'd been born in that country or whose father had been a citizen of the UK and colonies born in that country prior to independence. Simultaneously, the UK passed legislation proclaiming that all persons who gained a new new nationality on Independence Day will now cease to be citizens of the UK and colonies. So they were stripped of that citizenship. And that would apply to people regardless of where they were now living. And many people didn't realise that this had happened to them because it happened by operation of law automatically. Now I have to say lots of countries gained independence in different ways to this and identified their citizens differently. So we are just dealing today with the most common formula for independence that was adopted. The Immigration Act 1971 came into force on the 1st of January 1973 and it introduced the right of abode. Now a person who has the right of abode is someone who is exempt from immigration control. Section 2.1 of the 1971 Act provided that citizens of the UK and colonies who'd been born in the UK and islands, by which it means the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man, um, and citizens of the UK and colonies and Commonwealth citizens whose parents had been cucks born in the UK would have the right of abode. You would also have the right of abode if you were a citizen of the UK and colonies who'd been ordinarily resident in the UK for a period of five years prior to the 31st of December 1982. And if by the end of that period you had no time limit on your length of stay. Additionally, a female Commonwealth citizen who is or has at any time prior to 31st of December 1982, been married to a man who had the right of abode, would herself have the right of abode under Section 2.2 of the Immigration Act 1971. Now, for anyone who was originally from a country that had gained independence and was no longer, therefore, a citizen of the UK and colonies, they would have been very unlikely to qualify for the right of abode. So, for those people who were settled in this country but did not qualify for the right of abode, section 1-2 of the 1971 Act provided that anyone who was here in the UK on the date of commencement and was settled here would be treated as having been given indefinite leave to enter and remain. And that applied to anyone, not just to Commonwealth citizens. There are nuances and exceptions and slightly different outcomes for people from countries who gained independence after 1973, but I'm not able to cover those today, not in the time that we have anyway. Now, the British Nationality Act 1981 came into force on the 1st of January 1983. This act was the first that specifically provided and created British citizenship and it was given to all citizens of the UK and colonies who had the right of abode. Commonwealth citizens with indefinite leave to remain did not therefore qualify. The 1981 Act also made a significant change to the acquisition of British citizenship by birth. Everyone born in the UK prior to 1983 was automatically born a citizen of the UK and colonies with the right of abode. But for anyone born after, the 1st of January 1983, their citizenship was now wholly dependent upon the status of their parents. Since 1983, a person is only born British if at the time of their birth, at least one of their parents was British or had indefinite leave to remain. So unless they can evidence their parents' status, they can't evidence their own. Now, just a quick message on indefinite leave to remain. The 1971 Act gave Commonwealth citizens who acquired indefinite leave to remain under the Act some protection. Section 1.5 of the 1971 Act provided that settled Commonwealth citizens and their wives and children should continue to be as free to come and go from the UK as though the Act had not been passed. That protection was repealed in August 1988, and that left Commonwealth citizens exposed to the law, which already applied to everybody else, that a person would lose their indefinite leave to remain if they were absent from the UK for a period of more than two years. And they would then have to apply to return as a returning resident if they wanted that reinstated. Now, there is something of a debate over this aspect of the law, but the Home Officer at least being pragmatic 
pragmatic at the moment in that absences of more than two years prior to 1988 are not being held against Commonwealth citizens who had indefinitely to remain as a result of, of having got their settled status under the 19, uh, 1971 Act. Now, obviously, when these changes to people's statuses were happening, as, as I've already said, people didn't always know that it had happened to them because it was happening automatically. They didn't receive any paperwork about it. And the hostile environment, as we know, has had a, an incredibly serious impact on people who lack documentation. And that is why, of course, the uh, Windrush scheme has been set up. Now, I'm going to hand over to Jackie, who's going to take us through the scheme. Um, so uh, over to you, Jackie. You're just on mute at the moment, though. Thank you, Emma, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, so I'm just going to go through the Windrush scheme, which you will know uh, came about or was created in May 2018, following the whole series of articles um, that appeared in the media, uh, uh, you know, telling people uh, about the Windrush scandal. Um, and surrounding a series of high profile cases of people who were denied services or deported or had ended up in immigration detention. Um, and it wasn't until the Caribbean prime ministers who happened to be in England that month for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting and uh, made a massive row or caused a massive row when uh, the then prime minister Theresa May refused to see them or do anything about it. Uh, that she conceded and thereafter the Windrush scheme uh, was created. Now the Windrush scheme, people who can apply to it fall into four groups and because we haven't got a lot of time, there won't, there won't be much time to discuss various nuances about all the groups of which there are many <laughs> and much controversy too. Um, so I'm literally just going to take you through it in a formulaic way, just following the slides. And perhaps if there is time for discussion, we can come back because I'm sure if you, many of you will have many questions. So there are four essential groups and then there's another category of people and there's the issue about uh, good character. So the groups are the Commonwealth citizens who were either settled in the UK before the 1st of January, 1973, or people who have a right of abode, and that's always, uh, that's a controversial one. And some of you may be aware that there is a judicial review pending uh, uh, regarding this. Um, group two, people of any nationality who arrived in the UK and had ILR, indefinite leave to remain, before the 1st of January 1973. And group three, people of any nationality who arrived in the UK between the 1st of January 1973 and 31st of December 1988 and who have settled status. And that's also controversial because there are a number of people of the Windrush generation who've seen people from France and Italy and so forth um, <laughs> benefiting under the Windrush scheme and wondering how is that possible? Um, and group four, a child of a Commonwealth citizen, citizen parent and the parent was settled in the UK before 1st of January 1973 or had a right of abode. And of course there are the usual exceptions. So in terms of group one, um, that's quite straightforward. Simply, these are people who perhaps didn't avail themselves of the registration schemes that were around at the time. There were schemes in the 1970s, just before uh, the enactment of the 1971 Act on the 1st of January, 1973. And then there was another registration scheme um, in the 1980s under Margaret Thatcher. But this, the, this group, are people who can confirm or just seeking confirmation that they already hold British citizenship and uh, all they really need to do is to get confirmation of that and then pay for a passport because the thing to note about the Windrush schemes that applications are free under it but there's also been controversial the whole thing surrounded in controversy has also been controversial about why people have to pay for passports but um and I don't think that's a valid uh, criticism of the scheme because everybody apply you know British people apply for their passports so what you're being given is just status documentation and I think it's only reasonable that you know you make your application for your passport in the same way that everybody else does because that's what would have happened had you not been deprived of your status documents or not given them in the first place. 
Um, so to naturalize as a British citizen or for somebody with ILR and continuous residence since, since 1988, there's a few, a few things that you need to do. Um, you can't have had absences for more than two years. Uh, that's since 1988. And Emma mentioned uh, the issues that arise from the 1971 Act and some, I suppose, dispute about how that uh, really does affect people who are returning residents more so. So we've got a few uh, cases that we need to revisit because of this, but uh, Emma's absolutely right that the Home Office uh, has been, uh, I'd say, reasonable about how they've applied this to people who are victims of the Windrush injustice. And good character, we'll come back to good character later. Uh, but you do the life in the UK test, you know, the tests where there are 24 questions and you've got to get 18 of them right. And they're all about history and culture of Britain that also is controversial. Um, and to naturalise as a British citizen, having returned as a returning resident, there are resident requirements. Similarly, uh, the, the, the overlap of good character and life in the UK test applies to the next two categories. Um, good the resident requirements is really quite a, a, an interesting one because we've seen refusals on the basis that people have no ties to the UK. Um, and we think that's really quite unfair because if you would have been in the position to have been able to come previously, I mean, the fact that you were unmarried and, you know, we've got a case of a chap who was un, is unmarried and, and has no children in the UK. And so he's been, he's not been allowed back. Um, he's been stuck in Canada since the eighties, but we've seen people who, because they've been able to show, well, they've got some sort of center of their life in the UK remaining, i.e. children, adult children, grandchildren, and so forth, they've been able to come back. So it isn't universally applied. And, and I think there's, it leads to a lot of injustice. Or for confirmation of the indefinite leave to remain that they had, that's a no time limit stamp. And before the Windrush scandal, that's what most people were doing, was applying, I think it's about 254 pounds for it, sending that off to the home office with an application form and applying for evidence that they had no time uh, limit. But that's where the problem started because even to do that, you had to show that you'd been in the UK um, on particular dates. And very few people were able to do that because schools had closed down or, employment you know place the jobs had, had gone uh, employers no longer existed and and so forth and, and the whole issue around the Windrush scandal has been how difficult it has been for people who arrived here in the 60s 70s and some even before that to prove that they were in the country um unless they held a regular job and a lot of people sort of worked cash in hand or worked um for employers as i said who'd closed down or worked for employers as we've now found who hadn't been paying their national insurance and their pensions even though they've been deducting it from their salary so you know injustice upon injustice um and to apply for indefinite leave to remain outside the rules uh if their uh, indefinite leave had lapsed because of their absences so so uh, as said before Um, people of any nationality, the second group who arrived in the UK and had indefinite leave to remain before the 1st of January 1973 um, would have to show that they had continuous residence since the 1st of January 1973, usually for five years, and that there'd been no absences of more than two years since the 1st of January 1973. So if there had been again, they would go back into what, what we describe as the returning residence um, category. Um, a group that were disadvantaged uh, compared to Commonwealth citizens, yes, when it comes to citizenship, and uh, these sh should not fall outside the Windrush scheme. And group three, um, this is the group where you've probably seen some uh, coverage in the press that, you know, again, people from the Caribbean, you know, have been side sidelined because there's been reports of people from outside the region or outside the Commonwealth availing themselves of the Windrush scheme. But it, and, and, and it's one of the reasons why perhaps the Windrush scheme or the word Windrush is, is, is it, it's confusing because it isn't really about the Windrush. There's absolutely nothing to do with the Windrush and the boat or people from the Caribbean who you saw disembarking at Tilbury. 
it isn't about that at all, but in the minds and consciousness of people, that's what it's become to be known about. Uh, but anybody who was in the country before the 1st of January 1973 and the 31st of December 1908 can avail themselves of uh, the Windrush scheme. They can apply for confirmation that they had British citizenship or for a certificate of entitlement to a right of abode or uh, confirmation that, uh, or, or some documentation to show uh, that uh, they, they should be subject to no time limit. So in another form of indefinite leave to remain or certainly evidence of settlement. And this is subject to serious criminality, which uh, we come on to a minute, meeting the threshold of deportation, which as you know, is going to change or has just changed again. <laughs> And group four, children. Now, children, I mean, this, this is a really controversial one because a child of a Commonwealth citizen parent and the parent was settled in the UK before the 1st of January 1973 or had a right of abode can meet this criteria. They meet it automatically if they were born in the UK before the, nine, before the 1st of January 1983. Um, and there is some discretion here. We've, I've seen discretion applied. I don't know if it's a formal discretion, but I've certainly seen it applied. But it's very problematic because we've got um, lot, or you've probably seen the campaign run by Movement for Justice of, of people who came to parents who had a right of abode but came after the age of 18. Um, and in some cases after the age of 1988, though not all of them, and what is their status? And technically they have no status. And, uh, you know, they've been caught up in all sorts of things. One, de being deemed overstayers, two, where deportation has become an issue, they can be deported, etc. And so um, the, the Movement for Justice campaign is to say that the Windrush scheme should be widened to include the descendants, particularly those who came as adults, of the people who would have benefited pre uh, the 1st of January 1973. And registration as a British citizen under Section 1.3 of the act um, and so it, it, again it's kind of repeating but parent not British or settled at child's birth, parent has settled since birth, under 18, good character. So these are people whose parents themselves um, may not have settled. That's You've probably heard about the what's called the 10-year rule and it's been in the press uh, a lot over the last week because of that case uh, where the fees, you know, the extortionate fees of over £1,000 were deemed to be unlawful. And I think the admin costs are deemed to be something like 300 and odd pounds. I still think it should have gone further. I don't think children should be ch charged at all. But we should, I suppose, be grateful for small mercies. We've all, often seen cases of children, particularly um, black children who've had some involvement with the criminal justice system before the age of 10, um, being denied uh, access to, to this route. And, uh, and, and, and this is problematic and hopefully something that might change. Um, and naturalizing as a British citizen, uh, if you're born outside of the UK, arrived in the UK, after the 1st of January 1973, whilst under 18, residence requirement, uh, good character, and similarly, if your parents fall into one of the groups that we've discussed previously. Again, confirmation of ILR, indefinite leave to remain, or no time limit, can apply to people in this group, uh, children. And uh, so, those who don't want to naturalize or don't meet the good character requirement can get indefinite leave to remain. And also people who fall outside the rules, the immigration rules. Just to go back, don't go back on the slide, but just to go back to clarify something that, um, so for children who have attained the age of 10, their parents don't have to have any status. Um, in a way, it's a sort of a concession. Um, and sometimes that's not clearly understood because I get schools ringing me up about children. You know, if there's a school trip and they want to know well, why can't somebody get a, a passport or, and, and, and then the parents think they, the child wasn't entitled um, because the parents themselves have no status. They are effectively overstayers. And so this is something that's open to everybody who was born in the UK and reaches the age of 10. It's something that I think there may, ought to be more awareness about 
um, a more public uh, a campaign because we often see when we're looking at conducive deport cases, the number of people who fall into that category who were, you know, could have availed themselves of citizenship or, 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 or natural, could have been naturalized or registered rather, had they known about it. It's uh, something that there does need to be more awareness of. And returning residents, we've kind of touched on. Um, the strong ties factor is something that the Home Office has been using to refuse people. So there's been, particularly with people in West Africa, there's been quite a large number of refusals from West Africa, less so with the Caribbean, um, but there's also, I think, been less people in the Caribbean who've stayed out um, for more than two years. I think that with West Africa, people came here, they made their life here, they studied then there were opportunities back for them in West Africa. So they went back either to do jobs, but never in a million years intended to stay out and didn't realize that they had lost their right of abode or lost any sorts of status had they stayed out for more than two years. And I think the, the history of migration from West Africa and the Caribbean is very, very different in terms of who came, um, the backgrounds of people who came, the opportunities they had back in their own countries. And that's why I think the numbers are disproportionately higher with people from West Africa than they are with the Caribbean, but it's a real issue um, when the strong ties plus factors is used. And of course, if you can't qualify under that route, um, there is the, uh, you can get the multiple C visa, 10 year visa, entry visa, which means you can come and go um, from the UK. So it is another route to living in the UK and some people find that quite satisfactory. And just because I think I've got less than a minute, the good character, um, the good character is going to change. I think what's, we're going to look at it in one of the workshops. So because I've gone over my time, I won't deal with it now. But uh, there is a just so that you know that there is a good character requirement, um, and it is actually coming up in the uh, Windrush because there have been people who have been denied citizenship. Um, as a result of good character. Usually people at the upper end of the conviction scale, um, usually four years plus or multiple offense or convictions. But I've also seen cases where the Home Office haven't done that. And got, so it's, it's arbitrary, I think, um, but we'll come back to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie, that was brilliant. I hope this was useful to you. Thank you again, Jackie so much for, for joining us thank and doing this you're welcome uh, thank you for inviting me it's interesting i've learned a lot too we're always learning all the time thank you absolutely. Mm -hmm. thank you very much thank you. everybody okay thank you bye-bye <laughs>